It has now become clear that America is in danger from a growing far-right movement. All across this country, right-wingers are walking the streets without attacking the police, vandalizing property, tearing down public statues, or threatening the safety of innocent bystanders. This sinister behavior reinforces the racist norms that for too long have made this nation a living hell for oppressed black entrepreneurs, sports heroes, and political leaders who have had to stand helplessly by, watching on their enormous flat-screen televisions, while the occasional young black man who happens to be a criminal is harassed by the police for doing nothing, nothing more than robbing places and shooting people. As we now know, silence is violence, and many of these far-right wingers have been almost completely silent. An act of violence so destructive that it makes it nearly impossible to find them, vandalize their homes, terrorize their families, and destroy their ability to make a living. And what about the far right's unforgivable refusal to tear down statues of Christopher Columbus and George Washington? It should be plain to anyone that these were whiteness bearing white people whose rabid white whiteness created a white culture of whiteness in which it was somehow considered okay to hate someone simply because of the color of his skin. Without the discovery of America and the creation of the United States, there would have been no confederacy. So every time a right winger walks by a statue without pulling it down, he is essentially saying that he supports slavery. This is hate speech. So right wingers walking past statues should be silenced and then arrested because silence is violence. And we can't permit violence unless it's violence instead of just silence. Everywhere we look, right wingers of all colors continue to endanger this country by marrying each other and supporting education and religion so that their children have the unfair privilege of being legitimate, well-informed, and well-behaved. We must rid them of this privilege until all America is one big Portland, Oregon, instead of a functioning society. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. I feel hunky-dunky, life is tickety-boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky dee doo Ship-shaped, ipsy-topsy, the world is a bitty zing It's a wonderful day, hurrah, hooray, it makes me want to sing Oh, hurrah, hooray, oh, hooray, hurrah All right, we are back, but this is, is this the last week? Yeah, this is the last week before my vacation So you want to suck up all the clavin goodness you can Because the long, long clavinless week will be upon you at the end of this week uh, and you're doomed. So you want to enjoy yourself while you're here. One great way to enjoy yourself is to go on the Andrew Clavin YouTube channel and subscribe. If you leave a comment and it is somewhere in the intelligence level above, like completely asleep and dead, uh, it will raise the level of the conversation on this program. And so we will read it on the air today. We have one from David Winoker, who uh, writes, Pilot asked, what is truth? The Clavin standing a bit behind behind Jesus, whispered in 2,000 years, I'll tell you on my show, if you sign up and use the mailbag. And that's, that's a true, absolutely true story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's an absolutely, oh, no, it's not. What am I saying? Uh, in preparing the show, obviously, I do a lot of reading, and I use sources from both the left and the right. And as a result, I've reached certain conclusions. And here's just a sample of some of the conclusions I've reached. America has zero problem with systemic racism, whatever that means. It does have a problem with a manufactured black underclass whose dysfunction produces crime, drug use, and illegitimate children. This underclass was created and is kept in place by destructive Democrat programs that foster dependency and destroy families, but serve the Democrat elite by allowing them to buy votes and maintain power with public money and patronage jobs. That's one conclusion. Another is speaking generally, men and women are very different and their differences are extremely valuable to a well-functioning and humanist society. Feminism is a philosophical disaster that disdains femininity and insists women structure their lives according to the values of men. Another conclusion, there's no climate crisis. Human action can have deleterious effects on the atmosphere, and human ingenuity can stop and reverse those effects. We're not running out of time. Now, all these conclusions are arguable, but you can't argue them when the conclusions themselves are outlawed by a leftist communication system that has mastered the art of begging the question. Begging the question means that your argument's premise assumes the truth of your conclusion. Here's an example. We know police are racist because they use racial profiling. This begs the question of whether racial profiling is racist or even racial. In fact, in an area where people who look a certain way commit most of the crime, it's rational to be wary of people who look that certain way. 
When you hear people should be allowed to march for justice, that begs the question of whether they are marching for justice. When you hear that our endangered earth needs a Green New Deal, that begs the question of whether the earth is endangered and the question of whether the deal is actually green. Because the left has corrupted the news media to its ends, almost every news story begs some question or other. As a result, ordinary liberals are ignorant of the fact that their opinions are open to debate. That's why they're willing to silence anyone who disagrees with them. Now, you could say this situation requires the right to fight back with extraordinary courage against every leftist assumption. But that begs the question of whether the right has any courage, a question that remains entirely open. So let us talk for a moment about, before we really get into this, about rockauto.com. And the reason we want to talk about rockauto.com is because it gives us an opportunity to say rockauto.com, which is one of my favorite things to do on the air, rockauto.com. It sounds almost as exciting as it is because it really is exciting. It's a family business that serves auto part customers and has been doing that online for 20 years. So instead of getting in your car, which doesn't work because it's missing a part and pretending to drive to the auto parts store, store where you can talk to someone who pretends to know what they're doing and looks in the computer and asks the same questions you would ask, you can just say rockauto.com and that terrific voice and go on your own computer and get their unique catalog, which is remarkably easy to navigate. You can quickly see all the parts available for your vehicle and choose the brands, specifications, and prices you prefer. They've got an amazing selection with reliably low prices. So go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Write Clavin in there. How did you hear about us box? So they know we sent you and you want to say like Clavin. You want to say the same way as you say rockauto.com, but you also have to know how to spell Clavin to even say it like that. And it's K-L-A. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. There are no E's in Clavin. You may have noticed that, some of you. Uh, so here's a report from the Associated Press that was retweeted by ABC News. <laughs> I love this. Protesters in California set fire to a courthouse, damaged a police sa- station, and assaulted officers after a peaceful demonstration intensified late Saturday. Peaceful demonstration intensified. It got so peaceful that it actually, this courthouse just caught fire with how peaceful it was. It was so incredibly peaceful that the the courthouse just went, this place is so What does it even mean? I mean, the language doesn't contain enough uh, dishonesty for them to write a sentence that makes any sense whatsoever and maintain. You know, the Wall Street Journal had a headline, violence erupts in nationwide, as opposed to violence as it has been going on all this time. I mean, you know, think about it. There's violence now. The violence is spread from Portland. It's like a cancer. Any human evil is like a cancer. That's why it's different than, say, a hurricane or an earthquake, which also hurts people and damages property, but has no human will behind it. The human will spreads from person to person. There's now violence, not just in Portland, Portland Seattle, but Austin. Uh, of course, Chicago and New York, is, they're just being shot to pieces. And even calling them protesters is begging the question. What are they protesting? Is there something to protest? Is there violence? We keep hearing about this death, these killings of uh, young black men by the police. I don't believe that's true. I don't believe that's happening. I believe uh, there's a very high crime in many uh, poor black neighborhoods, and the police react to that, and they're more likely uh, to get in a, a fight with somebody who's committing a crime, but they don't kill more black people and white people, except as a percentage of criminal behavior, as a percentage of criminal behavior. And what constitutes violence? I mean, this is a question. If a, if a mobster walks into your store and you know he's a mobster and you know Don Corleone is b- backing him up and he says, you know, a nice store you got here, be shame if something happens to you. Is that peaceful? You know, is that is that a peaceful thing? If a mar- Is a marriage mostly peaceful if you only beat your wife once or twice a year? You know, it's not peaceful. It's not a peaceful demonstration if you can't walk there safely. It's not a peaceful demonstration if you can't disagree safely. It's not peaceful if property is attacked, if cars are surrounded and people hit your car with a hammer. That was one thing that happened, I think, in Austin, Texas. They surrounded a car, started hitting the car with a hammer. A guy approached the car, a protester, we'll call a rioter, attacked the car, uh, approached the car with a gun, and the guy in the car shot him. You know, it's Texas. I mean, everybody's strapped. So all of this begs the question of what's happening, and that is just beginning to get to also the incredible, the incredible lies which are everywhere. You know, I uh, last week on the show, I talked to my son, Spencer, who has his show, The Young Heretics, and he's doing John Milton uh, this week. And we were talking about a little bit about Paradise <coughs> Lost. And uh, yesterday, last night, Spencer was uh, over here uh, and we were socially distant out on the patio. And we were continuing this discussion about Paradise Lost and John Milton, which is about the fall of man and has Satan in it. And a lot of people uh, debate whether Satan is a hero, a tragic hero 
for standing up to God because God is so powerful that when a lone person stands up to him, uh, it, it has the aura of the heroic to modern people, modern people who believe in individuality. We were discussing this kind of an old, it's an old thing that English majors discuss. But I was saying that one of the things about Satan that makes him satanic is that he says at one place, the, he's not going to be bothered uh, by being in hell because he says the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. <clears throat> and I pointed out that this is one of the things that makes Satan satanic is that he's not responsible to reality. And in fact, he can't make hell heaven. He can only pl- make every place that he goes a hell, which he ultimately admits. He says myself in hell, and he ultimately admits that he turns everything into hell. And that's what I think is, is really the Democrats are trying to do. They're trying to convince us that they that what we're seeing is not true. And in fact, this is justice. This is democracy. This is nonviolence, when in fact, it's violence, non-democracy and fascism. And, you know, it, it's part of the American idea that we can become anything we want. But but that idea only makes sense if we're responsible to reality. I can't become a major league baseball player. I simply haven't got the skill. I can't become taller. I can't become a different sex. And so what the the left has done is they've taken that mantra that here in America, you can become anything you want, meaning a poor man can become president of the United States. A black man can become president of the United States. Anybody who is qualified or even not qualified, but can get the votes can become president of the United States. But not you can't become something you're not. You can't become a woman. You can't become a you can't just suddenly declare that you're white when you're black or black when you're white. All of these things, you have to be responsible to reality. The experience of being a human is an experience of the mind with a a confluence of the mind with reality. So Democrats, what they want is to be able to riot without being called rioters. They want to be able to silence people, but they don't want to be called censors. They want the press. The press wants to lie. But when Donald Trump points out that they lie every day, all the time, and every word they say, uh, he's attacking the First Amendment. Gerald Nadler. Now, you remember Gerald Nadler, right? He's the chairman of the House Judiciary and one of the main instigators of the Russian hoax against Donald Trump. He was approached by someone who said, what about all of this violence in Portland? Here's his response. You disavow the violence from Antifa? That's happening in Portland right now? That's that's, that's a myth. That's being spread only in Washington, D.C. About Antifa in Portland? Yes. Sir, sure, there's there's videos awesome everywhere journalism. online. There's fires and riots. There's th- they're throwing fireworks at uh, federal officers. DHS is there. Look online. It gets crazy, Mr. Nadler. <laughs> so, so there's Gerald Nadler telling this guy that this is a myth. It's a complete myth. And, and, and that guy is obviously right. We see the videos. People who are there are reporting from the scene. It's violent. We have people who said that it wasn't, vi- you know, hilariously, uh, there was a talk show host in, I think, in Seattle, uh, Paul Gallant, uh, who attacked Donald Trump on Twitter. Tw- uh, Trump said, you know, Seattle is violent. And he said, chill, dog. You know, I, there's no violence here. Paul Ca- Gallant now tweets, I came home to my apartment complex. The Starbucks underneath has been destroyed and cops are telling me to stay away in case something explosive is inside. It's not uh, nonviolence if you're terrified and if it, it, it's terrorism, right? If, uh, if everything is being destroyed around you and you don't know if you're safe. So the Democrat Party, th- this is Gerald Nadler, the guy who was one of the main instigators of the Russian hoax. And Nancy Pelosi took him off and put Adam Schiff in because Adam Schiff was the better liar. Adam Schiff was better at, per- uh, you know, perpetrating the hoax than Nadler was. But Nadler was one of the key instruments of this hoax. And th- the other day, and this is off to the side of the violence for a minute, but but it makes the point. Jim Jordan was talking about the fact that they blame Donald Trump for everything. This is Congressman, the Republican Congressman Jim Jordan. And he went through a list of the things that the Democrats have been doing in Congress. Here it is. Here you go again. Another day, another another Democrat attack on on President Trump. Democrats would like us to forget that the Mueller investigation, 19 lawyers, 40 agents, 50 interviews, 2,800 subpoenas and 30 million dollars found nothing. No collusion between Russia and the Trump campaign. Democrats would like us to forget Chairman Nadler's fishing expedition. Remember this? 81 letters sent to different people, different entities associated with President Trump, which also uncovered no wrongdoing. They'd like us to forget, actually, maybe they wish that we never even knew, that the officials from the Obama-Biden administration testified to the Intelligence Committee that there was no collusion at the time of the transition in 2017. 
And Democrats would certainly like us to forget the failed impeachment sham, the first partisan impeachment in history. The Democrats' impeachment was actually so unpopular that it actually made a Democrat member leave his party, leave that party, and become a Republican. They have been doing this since Trump became president, and really they were doing it when George W. Bush was president, too. If I, you know, I, I'm not going to play them now, but there are tapes of basically the entire Democrat Party supporting the idea because they're reading the intelligence that there were uh, weapons of mass destruction in, that uh, Saddam Hussein had in Iraq. And then when we went in and they couldn't find them, suddenly it was Bush lied, people died. I mean, Bush was looking at the same intelligence that they were looking at and they all agreed and they all voted that it was right to use uh, force if we needed to. And then suddenly they just abandoned ship, but they changed the narrative. This is what they are continually doing. I mean, they call it gaslighting, uh, you know, but gaslighting is meant to drive you insane. This is just meant to create a fantasy. And the, the problem with the fantasy is it comes up against reality, you know? In Minneapolis, where they are literally defunding the police, they're literally taking money away from the police. Residents in some areas who are still recovering from rioting and unrest are forming community watch and security groups, some bearing firearms, to fight a surge of crime in the wake of the George Floyd killing in May. At least one neighborhood has put up barricades to keep out away outsiders. So Minneapolis, where Mary Tyler Moore used to throw her hat in the air, Minneapolis is now an a series of armed camps with barricades to keep your neighbors out. And meanwhile, while that's happening, the city council on Friday approved its first permanent cuts to the police budget. So, so the, the police are disappearing and instead you're getting warlords, you're getting c- civilian, you're getting vigilantes. I mean, I, that's what they are. They have to do it. They have to defend themselves. I'm not knocking them for being vigilantes, but what a failure, what a failure this uh, is of the Democrats. And it's because they are making, tr- they believe that they can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. They believe that they can change reality itself. You know, there was a, a last month, the New York Times, this is from a journalist named Daniel Greenfeld. La- last month, the New York Times uh, had a what he calls a heartwarming story of the Powderhorn neighborhood where the residents decided not to call the police. And Minneapolis City Council President Lisa Bender said, if you are a comfortable white person asking to dismantle the police, I invite you to reflect. Are you willing to stick with it? Will you be calling in three months to ask about garage break-ins? I remember the story. Are you willing to dismantle white supremacy in all systems, including a new system? So they were they agreed, okay, we're not going to call the police. So what happened is a park that they had began to become a tent city. And with the tent city, what do you get? Of course, you get sexual sexual assaults. I mean, it's always the women who suffer. You know, anybody who is not as strong as the other guy is going to suffer. This is, and it's always going to be women because women have something men want. They're going to be sexual assaults. There are now three sexual assaults. And no, at first, nobody called the police. And now this park is overrun with drugs and crime. Okay. So now in Minneapolis, white people said, okay, we don't want to be racist, so we won't call the police if somebody breaks into our garage as if that was not a crime and as if that didn't endanger people, as if that weren't terrifying to have somebody break into your garage. We won't call the police. And what happened? The place was overrun by criminals. Their park has taken over. I'm sure they can't go to the park. Uh, somebody said, somebody, one of the activists in the park said, this is a means of land repatriation. This is a means of addressing historic deep disparities. Meanwhile, the park police, because now they are calling the police, of course, say they're dealing with assaults with blunt objects, a fentanyl overdose, and someone being chased by others with guns and baseball bats. This is what Democrats are essentially doing to the country as a whole. They are telling us that we can make the world a heaven by simply declaring it's heaven when it's hell. They're telling, they're turning our cities into hell and saying that it's racist to call them hell. So, you know, there's a high crime group of people. It is the this black underclass, which as I say, I think was, it's not because they're black. It's because the policies that have destroyed their families by paying them to have children out of wedlock, the policies that basically tell them if you don't work, you get more money than if you do work. The feminism that told them that families didn't matter and all these things has created this situation. And they say, well, if it's high crime, it's racist to say that there's high crime in black neighborhoods. Therefore, it must be the fault of the police who are defending all the majority of innocent, non-criminal black people who are the victims of this stuff. So when you say that you can declare heaven a hell, what you do, what, that you can declare hell a heaven, what you do is you turn the whole world into hell. And that is what the Democrats are doing. It really is satanic and it really is right out of Paradise Lost. Let us talk for a moment about about LifeLock, because there are criminals out there who want to steal your identity, which is just a mess when it happens. It's really sad that cyber criminals are taking advantage of this 
flu pandemic. They're sent malware to scam people trying to learn about cures for the disease. They've conducted phishing attacks and devised counterfeit online pharmacies. And they've also focused on the economic stimulus by creating fake banking websites. I always wonder about the minds of people who sit around and do th- things to people. And who gets caught? You get caught. You get your identity stolen. But LifeLock, will help. LifeLock detects a wide range of identity threats, like your social security number for sale on the dark web. If they detect your information has potentially been compromised, they'll send you an alert. And if you become a victim of identity theft, and this is a big deal, LifeLock can help you restore your identity easier than what you could do on your own. No one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses. LifeLock can see threats that you might miss on your own. Join now and save up to 25% off your first year. Go to lifelock.com slash Clavin. That's lifelock.com slash Clavin for 25% off and a free lesson in how to spell Clavin. It's K-L-A-V-A-N. There are no easy <laughs> I, I just make it look really this easy. So, you know, if you want to know the source of this, we found this video of America's news media meeting uh, last year to plan their agenda for 2020. This is cut one. I'd like to call to order this secret conclave of America's media empires. We are here to come up with the next phony baloney crisis to put Americans back where they belong in dark rooms glued to their televisions too terrified to skip the commercials. Well, I think... NBC, you are here to listen and not speak. I think we should go with a good old-fashioned public health scare. Uh, yeah. yeah. A new disease. No one's immune. It's like the summer of the shark, except instead of a shark, it's an epidemic. And instead of summer, it's all the time. That is so Now, I hate to be the guy who derails what everybody else loves. He loves being that guy. But, Janice, we do have standards. This can't be a made-up disease. The only moral thing to do is release a deadly virus into the general public. <laughs> So, all right, that's that's an old Simpsons episode, although God knows it could be the truth. But if you want to see, you know, so I'm joking about conspiracies, but if you want to see conspiracies, take a look at this little montage from Grabian. This is cut six, I think. It has been suggested that this is a trial run by the president of the United States who may be organizing uh, to not accept Uh, what happens when we have the election. I think we should all take very seriously the prospect that this is, as I say, a dress rehearsal, a trial run. You don't draw a line in the sand. This country may be looking down the barrel of martial law in the middle of an election. This is, I guess, the president's own version of martial law since the real military uh, has kind of pushed back from doing that. Is there anybody, having watched Donald Trump for the last three and a half years, who doesn't think that Donald Trump would try to employ martial law if he thought it was the only way he could stay in power? So so let's let's review here for a second. There's no riots. It's a myth. That's a myth. Right. And if Donald Trump should send in federal uh, agents to protect federal property, then it's it's martial law. And he's really just trying to take over the country. So the election will mean nothing. This is this is basically what you're being sold on what's supposed to be the news. I mean, how hard is it? How hard is it to just tell people what's going on? But of course, they're not there to tell people what's going on. They're there to support the Democrats. And so it's just it's just kind of an amazing thing to me that after all this uh, talk about what a liar Donald Trump is, you really have this parade. Not just it's not just lies. It's an entire fantasy world. It is the demand that we that they simply by t- changing the narrative can actually change the reality. And consider the poor people in Minnesota whose neighborhoods go to hell because somehow they were told that it was only racism that was causing the police to arrest all those lovely black males in poor black neighborhoods. You know, that's only what what could it be but racism? So they agree not to call the police and they lose their neighborhood. So here is and, and the other thing about this, too, is everything goes down the memory hole. Nobody is responsible for anything they said before. And the people like Adam Schiff, who lied uh, continually, the people who hoaxed us with the Russian uh, hoax, the New York Times has never said, oh, you know, this Pulitzer Prize you gave us for stories that turned out to be wholly untrue. We'd like to return this out of integrity. We don't want the Pulitzer Prize for reporting things that are untrue. There's no going back and saying, yeah, we we messed this story up. We For three years, we held the country hostage to this, and they're not going to do it now either. Here is the clown mayor of Seattle. It's really interesting. See, I didn't realize this. You have to be a clown 
Holland to get elected uh, mayor of Seattle. This is uh, uh, Jenny uh, Durkham. Yeah, she she she's the one. Now, just remember this. She's the one who told us that the Chaz, this area taken over by rioters was what democracy looked like. It was going to be the summer of love. It was going to be terrific. And she finally had to close it down when Donald Trump threatened to do it for her. Here here she is talking today about the federal agents. I know how important it is for federal law enforcement to work with local law enforcement. As a chief federal law enforcement officer, as U.S. attorney, I know that that's an important relationship. I've never seen anything like this in my career where federal agents are sent in, not even not with the cooperation of local law enforcement, but over their objection. It's unprecedented and it's the wrong way to go. The the fabric of America is being shredded before our eyes, Chris, and it worries me greatly. The fabric of America is being shredded before our eyes. I, I thought it was the summer of love. I was like just I was just dancing in the streets. It was Woodstock. By the time I got to Woodstock, uh, you know, I was just like living on a kind of high of a contact high of love and peace from Seattle. I mean, the dri- it was drifting down from Seattle. I, the summer of love. I got, and, and Chris Cuomo, fearless journalist that he is, doesn't say to her, how come everything you said before was untrue? Why should we believe you now? Why, when you tell us the fabric of America is being torn apart by the federal agents who had to be sent into your city because you told us that they, it was okay for rioters to take over part of the city, it was democracy, it was the summer of love. Where's that question? Where is that question coming? I mean, obviously, the, the sparks from Chris's brain are probably still traveling to his mouth. So <laughs> maybe you should ask. Uh, and then they die and it doesn't happen. But still, but still, still, everything goes down the memory hole. So it's not just lying. It's not just telling you not to believe your own eyes. You know, who are you going to believe the news media or your own lying eyes? It's not just that. It's everything disappears. My favorite was this is Ted Wheeler, who's not just Ted Wheeler is not just the mayor of Portland. He's the police commissioner. So really, basically, this guy should be when he appears on Chris Cuomo's show, he should be covered in tar and feathers. You know, he should just be it should just be this. All you should see is what looks like a gigantic chicken. It should just be covered in black tar with his feathers sticking out. He's both the police commissioner and the mayor of a city that has been under riots, been under threat of riots for over 50 days, right? So it's over seven days. It's almost eight weeks. It is eight weeks that it's been two months. His city has been rioting. He is the police commissioner and the mayor. And Chris Cuomo is like, good to see you. And here's Ted Wheeler's tale of woe. My big concern is that we have a federal occupation. We have federal troops coming to our city. They weren't invited here. We didn't ask them to come. We don't want them here. They're not trained for the purpose that they're here. And I was hearing from my constituents, and I'm talking about people who are doctors, people who are lawyers, restaurateurs, moms, teachers, and they were relating to me stories about Orwellian and certainly unconstitutional tactics being used by these federal officers. So I wanted to see it for myself. I went down there and I got tear gassed in my own city. <laughs> I don't, we played this last week. He went down there and they're shouting, F you. They're shouting, F, F the mayor, you're a fascist. You have no right to speak. He left that part out. Here is Trump's response, which I play just for comic relief. This is cut three. They were going wild for 51 days, and we went in, and, and uh, they've done a great job. They were going to rip down the courthouse, a big federal courthouse, gorgeous federal courthouse. So we went in, and we've been very, very strong. And we have this Mayor Whalen, who I think is also he's also the police commissioner, as I understand it, Wheeler. in Portland. Yeah. Uh, Mayor Wheeler. And he's uh, he made a fool out of himself. Less. He wanted to be among the people, so he went into the crowd, and they knocked the hell out of him. That was the end of him. So it was pretty uh, pretty pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> What's pathetic? It's, you know, I, I shouldn't be laughing. I, I know because people are endangered. Property is being destroyed. But it is kind of wonderful. It is wonderful to see these mayors who have lost control of their city, who have supported, they have sided with the rioters. They, they remember, remember, there's this entire city, an entire city that has the right to walk in their downtown, that has the absolute right. And this is what one of my problems with the homeless. There should, it, should, it should be illegal to sleep on the street because people have the right to live in a city that is 
is functional. That's why you're there. That's why they elected you. That's why you're taking a public paycheck. You're being paid by citizens' taxes. And these guys have lost control of their cities, but it's all Trump's fault. It is all Trump's fault for sending in federal agents to take care of the crime. One of my favorite, uh, this Lori Lightfoot, who really is, in, you know, kind of fighting with Bill de Blasio for title of worst mayor in the country, uh, maybe worst mayor in the galaxy. I mean, I think there are prob- probably people on the planet Googlon who are going like, oh, we never had mayor like that as bad as that in Googlon. I don't know. I've seen anything like it. These are the worst mayors in the galaxy. But she said, now, 56 people over the weekend were wounded <laughs> In Chicago, I, I'm, I'm, this is morbid laughter. Please don't think I'm laughing at this these tragedies, but it's just so unbelievable. 56 people were wounded and three others were killed. The wounded include a 13-year-old girl in Chicago. And here's the thing. The weekend's total is the lowest in over a month, right? This is an improvement of 56 people wounded in, in uh, Chicago. And Lori Lightfoot says, we are being inundated, inundated, This is what she says to people. I mean, I'm talking about this kind of gaslighting. We are being inundated with guns from states that have virtually no gun control, no background checks, no ban on assault weapons that is hurting cities like Chicago. Talk about begging the question. This raises the question of why don't these states that have virtually no gun control, no background checks, no ban on assault weapons, why don't they have the problems? Why don't they have the the problems that she has in her city, which does have all those things? Why don't they have the same problems? You know, it just begs the question. And do you think the person interviewing her is going to ask that question? Of course not. Of course not. It is a really, really amazing war on reality. And it's all about Donald Trump in the end. Let me just, well, I'm kind of out of time in this segment, but I, but I would like to just point out once again that really the people who are complain, the people who are saying that black lives matter, the people who are saying we are the party that helps black lives, the people who are saying we are the people who are make, bringing justice are the people causing this. And that's the biggest lie of all. And that is the biggest uh, challenge to reality of all. All right, let us take a pause and tell you about the Reader's Pass. I've been telling you and telling you about this. I just, I guess, God, you've got to get your minds right and finally get this reader's pass. Many of you have not gotten the all access uh, subscription because, you know, you're cheap. You know, you're just kind of greedy people who want to hang on to your money because you earned it and it's not ours, it's yours, and you want to feed your children. But for you, small minded, tight fisted people, we don't have all access, but we do have the reader's pass pass. With the Reader's Pass, you can get the real news that we will bring you if you're a political junkie who wants both sides of the story and get a Reader's Pass and here at at dailywire.com and you get all the great uh, work of Ben, of uh, Matt Walsh, me, that other guy, uh, I forget. But anyway, the membership tier is already a bargain at $3 a month. But if you join today, you get your first month for 99 cents. You get the mobile app, which is really is terrific, by the way. Uh, and you get free access to all of the Daily Wire news, exclusive op-eds and ad-free access, I should say, to all of the Daily Wire news, exclusive op-eds uh, and all our podcasts on the mobile app. So head over to dailywire.com slash subscribe and join today. So there's a story out of Nevada and the Supreme Court uh, that's really one of the ugliest stories that's happened in a while. And it, it, it's almost painful to look at it. But there was a, there's a, chap, a, a church, Calvary Chapel in Dayton Valley, uh, and it's in rural Nevada. And it wanted to have worship services for about 90 people. Uh, that's about 50 percent of its fire code capacity. Uh, and in conducting these services, Calvary Chapel planned Uh, to take many precautions that go beyond anything that the state requires. It uh, wanted to ask congregates to have social distancing. Uh, It was going to cut the length of the service in half. It also planned to require six feet of separation between between families seated in the pews, uh, to prohibit items from being passed around the congregation, and to guide congregants uh, to designated doorways. And all these things are going to take all these precautions precautions. Uh, According to an infectious disease expert, these measures are equal to or more extensive than those recommended by the CDC. However, Nevada Governor Steve Sisolak had a phase two reopening plan which limited indoor worship services to no more than 50 persons, right? But the directive caps a variety of secular gatherings, including going to casinos, at 50% of their operating capacity, meaning that they're welcome to exceed and in some cases far exceed the 50-person limit imposed on places of worship. So it's only 50 people in a church, but if you're going to gamble at Caesar's uh, Palace, 
then it doesn't, then 500 people are fine because that's half their capacity, right? Uh, the Wall Street Journal ran an op-ed on this called Render Unto Caesar's Palace. So this went to the Supreme Court and uh, by a 5-4 majority, uh, the majority refused to offer relief. They wanted an injunction and they refused to offer release, uh, relief against the Nevada order that restricts at attendance. And Chief Justice John Roberts joined the four liberal justices uh, to deny an application for an injunction. They wanted to stop this so they could have their service. Gorsuch, uh, Neil Gorsuch had a great one paragraph um, dissent. He said, in Nevada, it seems it is better to be in entertainment than religion. Maybe that is nothing new, but the First Amendment prohibits such obvious discrimination against the exercise of religion. The world we inhabit today with the pandemic upon us poses unusual challenges, but there is no world in which the Constitution permits Nevada to favor Caesar's palace over Calvary Chapel. Alito, who had a very long dissent, which was really interesting, but he said, when large numbers of protesters openly violated provisions of the directive, such as the rule against groups of more than 50 people. The governor not only declined to enforce the directive, but publicly supported and participated in a protest. He even shared a video of protesters stand, standing shoulder to shoulder. The state's response to news that churches might violate the directive was quite different. The attorney general of Nevada is reported to have said, you can't spit in the face of law and not expect law to respond. This is quite amazing. It is quite amazing. And John Roberts really should have to answer for this. Uh, you know, it's, it, he's not on a, he's a lifelong appointment. He's not an elected official. But by what, in what logic, in what world does the First Amendment allow a governor to, to go and participate in a protest that violates the law, but threaten churches if they violate the law? And of course, if Democrats are doing it, the media is doing it. There's no difference. There's no space between those two uh, entities. And so the media is doing this too. The media, you know, CNN uh, tweeted a picture of uh, people at an outdoor uh, faith-based uh, gathering in Northern California, right? And th they, uh, they, they said, video from a Northern California outdoor religious concert shows hundreds of people crowding together and most of them not wearing masks, drawing criticism from a local health department that says the gathering violated state coronavirus rules. But of course, none, none of CNN's coverage of the people who are rioting and protesting, as they say, uh, none of that ever embarrasses them or accuses them of anything. This is obviously, obviously about religion. This is obviously about suppressing prayer, and it is obviously a hostility toward faith. It is not that I don't think, I think churches of their own free will should take precautions. You're indoors, churches can get very crowded. But at some point, at some point, if you can go out and riot, and, not, and don't tell me those protesters are wearing masks, they're not. You should be able to have church services. And people have been arrested in their cars. They've been ticketed for having church services in their cars where there was no danger for having church services out of doors. This is an attack on the church and that the Supreme Court dropped this ball in the person of John. It doesn't surprise me that four liberals did it, but in the person of John Roberts that he should uh, buy into this to all I can assume about John Roberts is he's so afraid of the Democrats packing the court that he's basically packing the court himself. He's becoming the packed court that he's afraid of. There was a guy in California, in here, uh, named John MacArthur. Uh, he has a church named Grace Church, and I know people who go to this church. I'm not a big fan of John MacArthur. He's very conservative, and I don't like his obsession with uh, the Jews. Uh, and I'm not really, the, the one time I attended his church, MacArthur was not there. And I walked out because I felt that the, the guy was in, in, it's a very conservative church and he was in vain against homosexuality. And I was thinking, you know, I don't have a problem with people explaining why they think homosexuality is a sin. I do have a problem with a group full of, a room full of people who are not homosexuals, uh, sitting around being obsessive about it. Because I think like the, the gospels do direct us to turn to ourselves, to turn to the moat in our own eye, the, the plank in our own eye before we inveigh against, uh, our, our neighbors. And so it just seemed to me kind of mean. And it just, it, it, I, I found it to be mean. I read uh, John MacArthur's book, The Gospel According to God, did not like it. Uh, however, however, I say all this to set up the fact that John MacArthur is the one preacher that I'm aware of who is doing exactly what I think he should do. And this is very often true, that people who are more conservative than I am, people who uh, really stick to a very hard line, are sometimes the people who show up. 
the most. And I have to give all props to John MacArthur. Uh, you know, he, he and I can disagree all I want, but he is doing the courageous thing. If he continues to do it, like as I'm going on vacation next week, but if he continues to do it, I'm going to go to his church because I believe that Christians should be doing this. Let me just give you a little bit of the sermon he gave on Sunday uh, to a packed church. And he said the people just kept showing up. Uh, and, and he talks about why this is important. This is the first MacArthur cut. We understand that the world does not understand the importance of the church. The world doesn't understand that it's not just essential, it's the only hope of eternal life for doomed sinners. People have been very concerned to make sure people's physical lives are protected and in the process shut down places where there's hope for their spiritual lives to be transformed that they can live eternally in the presence of God. The Bible is very clear in describing the world of unbelievers. In Ephesians 2.1, it says they are dead in trespasses and sins, and they are children of wrath. And this is a guy who's really bringing it. He's really bringing the gospel, and he's bringing it under threat of the law uh, as the gospel was brought in the first days and is now being brought again. And, uh, and he points out, he makes a wonderful point about the fact that the people who run California, where there are more abortions performed than in any other state in the union, have no moral ground to stand on. Let's play the second cut. You could take all the cancer deaths and all the heart disease deaths, put them together, and they don't come to the killing of children in the womb. There's no moral high ground among leaders in this state. They've kept all the abortion clinics open through all these months. They've been deemed, along with the liquor stores, essential. So babies could continue to be slaughtered. But churches can't meet. This is the reality of a corrupt world. When babies have a one in four chance in our state of not even getting out of the womb, and hopefully, I guess, they would wish that the ones who do get out are politically correct. Well, good for him. He has the heart of Christianity, the courage of Christianity. If I disagree with him on points of theology, I have to say he is one person who is doing exactly what every church should do. You know, one of the biggest illusions uh, that uh, is created by our modern society is that the world gets better. The world never gets better. The world gets, life gets better in the world because we have luxuries, because we have science, because we have medicine. These are all wonderful, wonderful things, but they create the illusion that the world is a place that is going to just go fine. If you ever read that book by Steve Pinker, Stephen Pinker, uh, uh, Enlightenment Now, that people who say, oh, things are going to fall apart, uh, you know, are just uh, grim intellectuals who get a kick out of being grim, but they're always wrong because things just get better and better and better. Europe was at its height. It was at the, not only was it at its height, it was the cultural height of human civilization in the 19th century, the end of the 19th century. Europe, England was probably the greatest cultural height of, of humankind ever. It was 1914 when it committed suicide for no reason. When the World War I destroyed Europe and World War II finished it off, that just happened out of nowhere, right? R remember the deaths that were uh, created by World War I and World War II were deaths of technology, the same technology and science that made life better. The fact is, we need the church now more than ever. And all these people who thought that they were just going to make the world a better place by going out and building housing and giving to charity, no, you know, no, you have to stand against the world. You have to stand against the world. If you're preaching Black Lives Matter in your church, you have been co-opted by the world. All of this, all of this calls for defiance. All of it calls for defiance. We thought, you know, I, I sometimes kid my wife that we almost got out of history unscathed. You know, we lived in a great period of time. We lived in the peak. We were born after uh, World War II. We were born too uh, early to have to go into either the Korean War or the Vietnam War. Uh, we, we never saw war on our territory until 9-11 uh, when the Islamists attacked us, but still the war didn't come here. We lived through great uh, economic times, what we thought was a crash, uh, was usually just a little flutter 
in the stock market. But history has caught up with us. It always catches up with you. And it's time to re- remember that life is, is difficult. Doing the honest thing is hard. Doing the right thing is hard. Standing up to the authorities is hard. And, I, you know, I just I have I can't have too much praise for John MacArthur for doing that, uh, for saying, basically, come and get me. Every Christian in the country should be doing it. Every church in the country should be doing it. I have no problem with people wearing masks. I have no problem with social distancing. I have no problem with taking precautions. But taking precautions to the point that your church doesn't meet is surrendering to the world. The world is not your friend. Jesus is your friend. God is your friend. The world is not your friend. And we have, we've forgotten that because we've, we've done, as Paul Simon said, we've lived so well so long. We have forgotten the truth about the world. All right, I got to stop there on a fairly down note, but I'll be back again tomorrow. Remember, this is the last week before my vacation, so you want to get all the Claveny goodness you can. I'm Andrew Claven. This is The Andrew Claven Show. The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Robert Sterling. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Technical producer, Austin Stevens. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Assistant director is Pavel Wadowski. Edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio mixed by Robin Fenderson. Hair and makeup, or head and makeup, by Nika Geneva. Animations are by Cynthia Angulo. Production assistants, McKenna Waters and Ryan Love. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2020. If you prefer facts over feelings, aren't offended by the brutal truth, and you can still laugh at the insanity filling our national news cycle, well, tune in to The Ben Shapiro Show. We'll get a whole lot of that and much more. See you there. Mm-hmm.